Good evening, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the Harrisop Regional Series on this chilly Thursday night. Um, we're glad you're able to join us for tonight's program on the mighty schooner Westward and her more modern twin, Eleonora. Um, I think there's a couple of empty seats up here in the front and the bench if anybody wants to come up here. One, two, three, four, five, six ish. Those are actually reserved for our patrons. This is our final lecture of 2017. And, uh, well, it's running out of time. Um, and this year's been our best in terms of attendance. It's really, really been great. We've had some great speakers, and we really appreciate your support. Uh, if you're not a member of the museum, uh, please consider joining. You'll save $8 on these lectures. And uh, you can join us, and you can join us for the member's holiday party right here next Thursday evening. Uh, this is the night each year when we recognize and celebrate the legacy of Carlton Pinheiro, curator and historian of the Harris Opera Museum from 1975 until his untimely passing in 2000. Uh, and I'd like to extend a special welcome to Carlton's wife, Leanne, who's here with us tonight. Uh, I'd also like to welcome and thank Patrick and Gail Conley, who've made our annual Carlton Panera lecture possible. They're supposed to be sitting in these two seats. So Patrick and Gail, if you're here, come sit in them. If you're not, sure they'll be here soon. Uh, we couldn't do this lecture series without the support of our sponsors, American Cruise Lines, Bank Newport, Gallery Group, Points East Magazine, Cisco Brewers. Um, thanks to our uh, bartenders, Dave Stewart and Tom Grimes, uh, pouring uh, beer and wine for you tonight. Um, and as, uh, I hope you enjoyed the uh, slight upgrade to the, uh, to the food. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, annual <laughs> the annual Frostbite Bash, uh, our annual fundraiser, is coming up on February 10th. The Bash Committee has been hard at work on making this the best one yet. And I think they're uh, well on their way. We have a fantastic group of restaurants and caterers bringing us some awesome food. We have an open bar, a terrific silent auction, and our friends, the Diggit Band, used to be called the Sixth Digit Band, but they had the seven guys who had the Digit Band, are coming back for a return engagement. All that for 85 bucks. Uh, it's a really special night, and it's become our biggest fundraising uh, event of the year, which helps us continue to improve the events and programming put together for you. And it's a great party. It really is awesome. Um, if you go to the museum website, or to frostbitebash.com, you can get more information, and you can buy tickets again it's February 10th. And if you buy a ticket before January 15th, you can get them for $15 off, $70. So please come and join us. Everybody will need to get out of their house in early to mid-February. This will be a really fun night. Um, now, as most of you know, the schooner Eleonora was a guest at our docks this summer and fall. Um, they, had, they actually got out of here before the snowflakes came, but they waited. They left it pretty late. Um, and several folks in this room had an opportunity to go for a sail on her, uh, myself included, this summer. Uh, it was a real eye-opener for me, uh, and it really impressed upon me the range of uh, Captain Nat Harrisov's genius, um, from multi-hulls to torpedo boats and from frostbite dinghies to mighty racing schooners. The man really could do it all. Um, Eleonora is a near-perfect replica of the schooner westward. Built here on the waterfront in 1910 and skippered by our old friend Charlie Barr. Um, Halsey Harrisov is here tonight to tell us the story of Westward and her exploits and how she was brought back to life as uh, Eleanor. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Halsey Harrisov. Bill, to give me a little instruction here, which I need as usual. And I'm very delighted to see uh, so many old friends and a few new friends here. And uh, it's so nice that we could get together here on the last day of November in 2017 and think about those glorious 
summer times when you can sail all kinds of herself boats, including this replica of the summer of the uh, replica of the great schooner Westwood. This is the Calvin J. Pinero lecture, which we hold every year. And it's intended to be always a lecture that enables you to be related closely to the core values of this museum. And certainly, uh, our focus tonight on the 1910 schooner Westwood and the um, 2000 schooner Eleonora, which is, uh, as Bill has said, is a very exact uh, reproduction of the earlier boat. Uh, those two crafts represent really one of the very strong highlights of the whole Parasoft design and building history. This uh, <coughs> annual lecture was suggested by Liam Nero, and uh, it has been uh, very effectively backed by Dr. Patrick Connolly and Gail Connolly, who, as Bill says, we anticipate to occupy those two seats over there, and I, I think they will be coming. The lectures have been on all sorts of subjects with many different people, and uh, we try to do them each year as close to the core subject of the museum as possible. So I'm going to speak to you first about the Westwood, which definitely was one of the very great boats of uh, the production here. And uh, then I'm going to go from that to a description of the new boat, the Eleonora, which, as Bill said, honored us by being in our pier all summer. <coughs> and uh, Bill and the staff here had organized that uh, the very nice captain of the, uh, that's the professional captain, uh, Brendan McCoy, so when I asked him what his name was, he said, I'm the real McCoy. And I think <laughs> he uh, was persuaded to give a lecture a couple of weeks ago. And about a week before, he said, no, sorry, can't do it. There's a weather window. We've got to sail our yacht down to Antigua, so I can't do a lecture. So the uh, museum considered just canceling the whole thing. But uh, a better idea was to postpone it a couple of weeks. And since we didn't want to neglect to have uh, Brendan involved in it, uh, we had an interview with him up in the model room, which uh, the old uh, uh, a video of, and um, it was a pretty good response from him, and I'm going to show that uh, at least 10 minutes of that uh, interview to you as a lot of part of this uh, presentation. I mean, you'll find it very interesting to see a guy who's a professional sailor and skipper so utterly enthusiastic about the command of this great schooner, and that's a good thing to see. We've also um, solicited a um, communication from Mr. Zack, who was the, has been for 13 years the owner of the other He was not the original owner, but he's been the owner for a long while. And I'd like to read that uh, note from him to you to indicate the spirit that this yacht has engendered in him, both for his own experiences and for what it represents overall. Mr. Zack is an interesting fellow. He's a uh, was formerly the, a treasurer of the uh, largest privately owned bank of Switzerland or of Europe. And uh, when he retired, he wanted to get a yacht. He'd never been a sailor. So he decided he'd start out with the biggest, finest yacht he could get. <laughs> <laughs> he was here. I might not tell you this, but uh, he wouldn't mind, I guess. But his name is interesting. His name is uh, Zygmunt Zack. And curiously enough, he lives in Zurich, <laughs> which he more curiously is next to Zurich in Switzerland. So I used to uh, kind of kid him, and I'd say, You're Z, 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 Z. After a while, I got the impression maybe he wasn't continuing to be amused, so I stopped saying that. <laughs> anyway, he's got a lot of Z's. I did say to him one time, I said, You were probably very lucky in uh, grade school because you were the last one that. Call on the classroom. He said, Oh, no, no. He said, uh, In Switzerland, we start from the back of the alphabet going forward. <laughs> that was always the rest. He writes uh, very uh, kindly here uh, messages I'd like to give you. 
He says the key consideration in buying Eleonora 13 years ago was her history. And the combination of being a very fast racing machine and one that is very comfortable cruising in uh, all kinds of worlds. This has allowed Suzanne, his wife, and me to share with our friends and guests the thrill of competitive big class yacht regattas and the magic of exploring and enjoying faraway cruising destinations. And by the way, I, along with certain friends like uh, uh, others that sail with him, uh, have had the pleasure of doing a lot of races with him and also some cruising on this yacht, and it's been magnificent to be able to do that. Adam Langman and I have both been very active uh, back along in uh, managing navigation and tactics and racing. That's been great fun. And so, Mr. Zach continues, today we have in this world a world of instant communication. And we're surrounded by all sorts of electronic gadgets push-button controls, and high-tech. I wanted to contribute to preserving the legacy of sailing large classics, the big class, and to keep the history of these magnificent yachts alive for the next generations. They very much deserve to be brought back to life. Nice sentiment. Over the past 13 years, I have attempted to follow the Westwood heritage and the tradition of racing with style and sportsmanship and in the Corinthian spirit. It has been a great opportunity to share this with our friends and with guests and all people who are passionate about classic sailing yachts as much as we are. Over all these past years, the Harrisoft Marine Museum has been an important part of our association with Eleanora and also with many occasions in our efforts to keep Eleonora as close as possible to her famous predecessor yacht, the Westward. We are very grateful for this valuable support, and in return, the Harrisoft Green Museum deserves support from all of us who are keen to preserve it as a part of the American yachting heritage. I hope that he really believes that last part because that's very important to us. <laughs> So, uh, let me start, as I said, with the Westwood. She was uh, contracted for in um, 1909, not until October, or maybe early November, and yet she was launched on March 31 in uh, 2010. And amazingly, with a very complicated vote, with a particularly complicated rating, she was all ready and finished so that Captain Charlie Barr could sail her out of here in uh, the month of April and get back, get on over to England in May to uh, make preparations for a great sailing and racing season over there. And for us today, who we'll continue to design and build boats, we can't understand how Captain Knapp could design a boat of this complexity starting in November. And then, of course, for this very talented crew, go to work and build the boat, uh, you know, cast the lead keel, bring in uh, all kinds of uh, <coughs> steel sections, form them into the shape, set them up, rivet the hull plating on. We have the original design model up in the model room here. And on that model, if you've ever seen it or want to see it, it has a uh, line stripe on it to show the plating that goes on. That's something that's often done in big shipbuilding. You uh, line on a model the plating, and therefore you cut the plates out and cure them to shape and fit them. And then to uh, build the deck beams and the plated deck, uh, lots of steel work, and uh, build the spars. He made many of the sails, and very complicated rigging. And one of the great things was uh, that even in a boat as big and complicated as the Eleanor, he was able to follow the practice of smaller boats like the famous Harrisoft New York 30s. My father told me that when the 30s were built in 1905, they would 
put them together in six or eight weeks in the shop here, kind of a production line, and they'd load them in the the once. And then they'd launch them, and within a half an hour, a crew would jump aboard, take all the cars, uh, fasten the standing rigging, uh, secure the running rigging, and after half an hour, get all the boats already to be delivered to the customer. <laughs> well, maybe the Eleanor wasn't, maybe the Westbrook wasn't quite that quick, but I bet she was rigged in two or three days and uh, very soon ready for the travel trip and, and off to uh, Europe. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to say a little more about Colin Bonero. We thought this was so good <coughs> to have right here. Here he is with some of our artifacts. And this picture was taken uh, on the occasion of our moving the uh, Daniel Green Harris of Mountain Road from uh, our house over here to the museum. <coughs> And so these are some of the items you now see in the model room, and we we'll just bring them over and decide where to place them there. On the bottom is a model of a South Sea Island Proa, which we believe was an inspiration to Captain Nan Herosov in developing the first catamaran. The first catamaran he built was this model that's up here on the top. And uh, that was built by Captain Nan in the winter of uh, 1874, 1875. And you see it's made with two uh, very light hulls and a tripod mast and the sails. And um, besides being the first racing catamaran in America, not the first catamaran, but the first racing one, it probably was the first composite construction in America because he made the model uh, hulls out of a composite of uh, paper and uh, resin. Probably the first time that was done. So if people wonder, if Captain Nat was alive today, whether he'd be using fiberglass, I think that's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin <clears throat> helped so much with everything. I greatly admired his uh, <clears throat> extreme capacity in teaching the English language. He uh, particularly loved Moby Dick and other classic books. And during the last three years of his teaching, he had the three students three successive years who got the prize for the best uh, composition of English literature in the state of Rhode Island. So knowing that, whenever I wrote something, <laughs> it was kind of Bristol or anything else, I'd give it to Calvin. And he would follow the great switches of, uh, if you're familiar with Strunk and White, eliminate all unnecessary words. He'd shorten what I write, he'd make it more punchant, and better every time, and I always said, thank you very much, Calvin. They might even think I'm a good writer someday. <laughs> he also went with me on some of the uh, adventures of the museum, uh, taking or getting boats down in Maryland. And twice we journeyed out to Detroit. And that was because we had persuaded a loan from the Henry Ford Museum of two Harrisoft yachts that were there. One was the Sadie, which is the boat you come to your first crossover the whole boats on the left there. And that was a boat built by Captain Nat and his brother in 1859, when Captain Nat was only 11 years old. And they built it to sail down to New York to see the great line of the Great Eastern. And so uh, after that was given to Henry Ford, and he'd had it on display a long time, they took it off display, and we got them to loan it to us. And it's been the practice here at the museum, as you may or may not know, that when we borrow something, we never return it. <laughs> so, all in that took a few years later, we heard that the Amaryllis, which is a replica of Captain Nance's first catamaran, had also been taken off display, and we persuaded the uh, museum out there to let us out of that also. <laughs> but when we got out there, it was all disassembled, and the hulls were positioned very precariously above the pack of the automobile in which John F. Kennedy was assassinated. On the Lincoln. And maybe it was the Lincoln, I guess you're probably right about that. Uh, anyway, um, I didn't know what to do because I, I certainly didn't want to have us be blamed for dropping a yard hole or something like that. 
So uh, the museum didn't help us much, but they did assign some cards <coughs> to us who didn't seem to be very interested. So of course I had a friend and I started giving him a lot of instructions. And I couldn't understand why these kids didn't do what I said. Well, I found out later that they confided in Carlton that they couldn't understand this crazy guy from New England <laughs> with his strange accent. <laughs> so they asked Calvin, what did he say? So Calvin, who was from uh, some Portuguese extraction, was uh, translating my Bristol English into English that those louts in Detroit understand. <laughs> and we extracted the holes and the rig and drove it here, and here it is in the museum. Also number two. <laughs> so, Carl and I had a lot of fun, and I miss him greatly. I continue to admire him as much as ever, and we still take inspiration from his record, and particularly at uh, Brian's suggestion, we are so pleased to be able to have these lectures in his name here. So, we'll go on now to the next slide. This is... Uh, Rendering which comes from a wonderful booklet that Ms. Kazak put together of the story of Western Eleonora. And it's very impressive how well it's written and how good the illustrations are. I'm going to show you a number of them. And another impressive thing is that he never mentioned himself in it, even though he's the one that has been more than anybody, the one that has made the Eleonora what she uh, is for the pleasure of so many people. But you can see that this is a very, very fascinating yard, 136 feet long, uh, nearly 200 feet if you include the bowsprit and the overhanging boom, and the rig about 185 feet in the air, uh, built of steel, and with uh, this terrific uh, schooner rig. And you'll see some of your proportions over there, the dimensions over, and it's fair that he's labeled it Western and Eleanor because the dimensions are uh, essentially identical. I've often wondered how <clears throat> Captain Nant was able to come to building this yacht westward with his great complications, given the fact that he had not built very many schooners. But of course, it all goes back to his entire record. The, uh, <coughs> The, uh, Sadie, his boat Riviera that he's sailing around Europe in, the Clower, which we have on all the boats, a yacht that is revolutionary and uh, named for his wife, Clara. and um, the naval torpedo boats, which had the steel construction that probably was the basis for his uh, developing those methods that applied to the uh, large steel yachts. And then the, uh, the Great America's Cup defenders, the uh, Vigilant, Defender, Columbia, Constitution, the Lions, and Resolute. Uh, of course, the Resolute had actually come later on, but uh, those big boats were a basis for a lot of the techniques used in the uh, building of the schooners. But as you can see from this record of the schooners, that he didn't really build any of them prior to 1900. I don't know whether that's because he didn't like the schooner rig, <coughs> or that uh, he just never had a customer who really asked for a scooter rig. But he did build a very important boat named Ingomar in 1903, so that was seven years ahead. And no doubt the Ingomar was in very many respects a pioneer for <coughs> complicated rigs, as was the Queen, <coughs> built, uh, finished in 1906, which is a very fine boat. And by the way, the Ingomar is partially uh, represented by a replica construction in the Netherlands by Ed Castellan, who built the Eleonora in 2000. And we hope that he'll be able to continue and to bring forward the Ingomar. And if so, we hope the company will still have all a chance to enjoy that first of the swimmers. And you see, after that, he went on to a great many others for Morton Plant and uh, Mr. Todd and two for Harold Vanderbilt, and on down the line, one for the Tiffany's. And that continues to the Mary Rose, which was the last one built in the 1925-26 winter. It's the same year that I built in New York for Avery Rose was built. 
And uh, uh, that Mary Rose is completely restored, continues to sail and to race every winter down in Antigua, which is also a great thing. The West Bank. This picture, I think, enables you to appreciate and recognize the power of this vessel. Uh, look at the great bow wave and the shape and all the crew on deck, and not those sails. In most respects, absolutely perfect in terms of the shape. And many of those sails, the original ones, were built right here. And this is uh, from the cover of Mr. Zach's booklet. And it shows the 1910 Westwood and the 2000 Eleonora. By the way, the builder of the Eleonora was another passionate uh, kind of sort of history, as is Mr. Zach. So I went to see him when he was building the yacht uh, a year or so before she was constructed on the ways. And he asked me if I would come over for the launching. And being an historian as he was, he made sure to launch the Eleonora on March 31, 2000, 90 years to the day after the Westwood was launched right here, in March 31, 1910. And I very much enjoyed being there and witnessing that occasion. This is uh, action on board the Eleonora and some racing in 2006 in Antigua. And I think, Ed, if you and I were on board that race, I'm pretty sure we were. We're probably in this race somewhere. A lot of the people that are all the same shirts. <laughs> <laughs> this is a view with a partial drawing of the line shape. I don't know why it's not complete, but it's partial. And you can see the elegant sort of uh, the various curves on those lines. So she's a very uh, typical, aerosoft, easily driven yacht. And you can see from this lower view of the uh, <coughs> uh, profile of the yacht, the lead keel here, and the strong base for that, and uh, framing. This is not longitudinal framing, it's more conventional framing at every 20 inches spacing. And uh, a large bilge, which in the case of the Westwood was largely vacant. And in the case of the Eleonora, was loaded with diesel engines and generators and all of that kind of stuff that uh, modern yachts need. And as a consequence of that, uh, when she was built, they had to minimize somewhat the weight of the keel to make up for the weight of that machinery. So therefore, the Eleonora isn't quite as stable as was the Westwood, but She's plenty adequate, stable for what she does. And you can see this wonderful flush deck with only a few houses and things in the foremost of the main, main list here. And uh, it's a great pleasure to sail <coughs> a vessel with an open deck like that. Now, of course, today they have only nine or ten in the crew. And uh, you'll see in this interview with the uh, professional captain uh, his statement of how they do that. In the day of uh, the Westwood and Charlie Bob, they would have uh, about 20 uh, in the crew crossing the ocean. And then they'd take on at least 10 more for 30, and sometimes have 40 or 50 people on board in the heavy the races over there. All very well organized and uh, made efficient by Captain Bob. This is a midship section, and you can see the uh, elegant shape there and the uh, fact that there are uh, formed steel frames, steel deck beams, and the plating outside here in the deck had thin plating and then it had uh, wooden decking over that so she had a wonderful wooden deck. And uh, a little hard to probably digest all of this but this is the interior view and I'm going to show you some pictures of the interior of the Eleanor, which is gorgeously constructed, just as was the interior of the Westwood so many years ago. <coughs> now, if you went aboard this boat, as some of us did this summer, you would be amazed how many lines there are, 
And of course, it's on the old square riggers. Any crewman with assault has to learn where the line is. So that you say, uh, take some tension on the fore topsail. You know to go and take the tension on the correct line, not the wrong one. The launching of the westward. <coughs> March 31, 1910. And I have here a note that uh, came to us of uh, what Captain Barr thought when he saw this yacht. Captain Barr, of course, by then had established himself as the world's finest yacht racing skipper. He had um, won the America's Cup three times, twice with the Harris <coughs> Columbia in, 19, in 1899 and 1901, and also with the Magnificent Alliance in 1903. He'd also been the skipper of Atlantic, <coughs> the large three-masted schooner that broke the uh, record from the United States to England, a record that stood for 100 years, not broken until uh, 2005. <coughs> and when Barr sailed the westward course. He wanted to break his own record with the westward. And he was ahead of the uh, passage of Atlantic for a good part of the way, and then they struck quite well in near England and they did not break the record. There's an old legend, which I don't think I quite believe, but I wish it was true, that Barr was always very aggressive and wanted to get the most out of the boat and was very willing to pile on sail at night. The old legend is, uh, oh, uh, thought it is, and I suppose it might be what Mr. Trump would call fake news, <laughs> was that the, cap the captain of the vessel, I wanted to pile on a lot of sail, but his owner, who had retired to the stateroom, wasn't too pleased about that. He thought it was dangerous to pile the sail on. Well, the old legend is that Bob walked down the passage, locked the door, he opened his cabin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw the wish that was true, but I, I didn't know it was not. But Bob was an amazing guy, and uh, he was such a cool hand that he could recognize what was a great boat. So when he came to the luncheon, he'd actually been here quite a while, because he worked very closely with yeah, himself in the details and in the arrangement of things and in the uh, training of the crew. But he said when he saw this, view that we see of this great yacht coming out of the shed and launching. He says she's a wonder. And he said that he felt that it was a dazzling schooner, Westwood. And his prophetic pronouncement would reverberate throughout his career <coughs> of this orange swelling vessel as she sailed her way to unique Sodom during the golden age of big class yachts. I think that's putting it very well. Well, of course, um, prior to the sailing, the real star of all this was Captain Jan Herzog, and here he is. And you know much about the story of him, and you know the um, one six scale model of Alliance, which demonstrates the, not only the fantastic portions and construction of a Herzog yacht, but the detail of the rigging and all that kind of thing. And um, <clears throat> I'd just like to add to your of him, a statement which I <coughs> saw in the to this, a statement by none other than Alpha Fox. If you don't know who Alpha Fox was, he was sort of the dominant selling man of England for many decades, lived in uh, the other white and cows, and uh, he sailed a lot on the We Win, which is the yacht that was recently uh, fixed up here which was a very small uh, yacht with a big keel, one of the earliest big keels built here in 1891, in which we were able to get back from England after uh, many, many years. And Uncle Fox, who was himself a naval architect, had this to say about Captain Knapp. He said, having studied the designs with which Fife and Nicholson, the two great artists who were the designers of England, and having endeavored to win the America's Cup, it's interesting to take a peek at the other side of the Atlantic. Not only did Nathaniel Green herself design Reliance in 1903 and Resolute in 1920, but he designed the defenders which turned back all six challenges 
from 1893 to 1920. One cannot but be amazed at the ability of one man whose designs competed successfully against those of three great masters, G.L. Watson, William Fife, and Charles E. Nicholson, that is the English designers. And yes, Western undoubtedly came from the right stable. This gentleman is the original owner of Westbury. His name was Ellis Cochran. And he came from a very wealthy family in Yonkers, New York. They made their money in carpets, which I guess you can make money in anything, even in carpets. <laughs> so he spent his life uh, hunting in Europe, <coughs> driving fast cars, and building and selling yachts. And when he wanted a yacht, he uh, could have anything he wanted, and uh, he went to the best people. And the story is that he went to Captain Bond, who he knew, and he said, what do I do to get Mr. Harris off to design and build a boat for me? So far, I said, well, all you have to do is to uh, go up to Bristol and meet with uh, Nan Harris off and tell him what type of boat you want and uh, the overall size of it. <coughs> And uh, be sure you don't try to tell him how to design it. <laughs> and prove you can pay for it. And then go away and don't go back to launch it. <laughs> That's the way it was. Not only with Westbrook, but with many other boats. Don't have to do it today and go over the woods of the bunk on the wall and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> the reason he's dressed up in this uniform is that subsequent to the time of the Westwood, Alice Cochran, who was a very uh, loyal and generous man, he loved Britain. And during World War I, he, just, he had built five or six torpedo boats, which he gave to the Royal Navy. And he did other things that helped Britain. And so he was honored with an honorary, uh, I guess he must be a captain in the Royal Navy. And here he is in full dress with. Uh, the sword. And here he is sailing the westward. And uh, I probably shouldn't make an observation like this. But, uh, <laughs> it's very interesting, isn't it? That here he is on the boat looking absolutely uh, uh, tight and uh, maybe blurry. And behind him is Captain Bob, absolutely composed, feet together, <laughs> looking on. Not saying a word, so there's a lot of comfortable. Hoffman had done a great thing to get the boat built and to lavish on it everything it needed, and uh, he sailed across the ocean with Bar, and he went on most of the races over in Europe. That's somewhere in 1910. Yes, the coming into the Red Hours and Isle of Wight after a day of racing, and here. Being, having been towed out to a race course, and uh, even in England, occasionally they have no wind, but most of the time there's plenty of wind over there. I was uh, not only a superb sailor and a highly aggressive uh, racer, but he was a wonderful gentleman. He was a very short man, only about five feet, four inches tall, and uh, yet he was a giant in every other respect. And here he is greeting visitors who are coming on board. <coughs> Uh, Westward, and uh, you see, he took the, the coat of that gentleman and came on, and he himself is passing the coat down the road of, of the, uh, the sailors down below. And here's this group coming aboard, ready for a day's sailing, ready for a race. And that's the way it looks sailing on Westward. And this is a picture looking from the lee side along the deck, and you can see Captain Bauer at the wheel, and again, totally composed, <laughs> sitting in a comfortable studio, stirring the boat, no, no sweat. And that, he just whispered to his mate, Bauer never shouted to anybody, but after attack, he would have Christensen, his mate back there, and he'd whisper in his ear, and he'd say, I'd like to have you get them to cast off the, um, old sheet a uh, second or two earlier, 
and more smartly trim in the uh, stasial sheet after the tech. So Christensen then would go forward and hand that order. So that his method was to always be improving everything all the time. Another attribute of Bauer was that he had a photographic memory. And when he was entering a race, he would read the circular. And from then on, he'd never have to look at it again. If anybody in the uh, cockpit asked a question, he'd say, oh, yes, that's the way there. And it's so many miles. And uh, the road report, he knew exactly what was going to happen all the time. And one of my uncles told me that, uh, Michael Griswold, that he sailed on a boat named Avenger. And the name of that boat was for the fact that the owner had had a boat that didn't do very well on New York Cruise shortly after 1900. And he was very disappointed because those guys that had these great yachts were very, very competitive people. They always wanted to win. So he had Captain Nat design a boat, and he named it Avenger to make up for the bad season previously. <laughs> and he had Barba sail it. And my little kid said that he went along in one of those races. The kid would have been only maybe uh, oh, 12 or 13 years old. And he said that he led the cockpit. And Barr would not only remember every single detail of the race course and what they were doing, but while he was selling the boat like this, he'd be telling sea stories about some of the races that were going on and what they'd had to do and how they were able to win that race. So he was obviously the most remarkable person, and probably, it's fair to say, he's one of the most capable racing sailors of all time. Here he is at the helm also, running now and then, not very much wind, but you can see the, uh, uh, see the spinnaker pole here. You can see the spinnaker pole out here to start it. And the uh, mains trimmed in a little bit, because the idea you have to trim the main in to keep the spinnaker from back in the main so and making it efficient. And this is a curious picture you need to study right here. I couldn't understand this. Well, they're three mats, but you see what they're doing. <laughs> this is a sloop on the windward quarter of uh, Western, undoubtedly getting a very bad bash of wind off the mm -hmm. Western, and it ruined that sail shape. And uh, that's a sloop right there. And behind her, her head, is the Western with her main sloop and her foresail and her stay sloop. And this is obviously a heavy wind day because even though photography always minimizes the roughness of the water, you can see all these boats sailing without their topsails. And the Westwood looks like she's in the lead in the race. This boat, where she is going to have to tack away pretty soon, not to be moved by the window of the Westwood's sails. Well, the Westwood sailed across to Europe, of course, and um, uh, Mr. Cochran sent a letter to Captain Nat. In those days, there were wonderful letters that were sent, and because of that, and because Noreen Rickson, who was the librarian here, has done such a great job. And, we have an incredible record of what happened in those great years. And I have to think that 50 years from now, when somebody else is here giving a talk like this, there's not going to be any new records because it's all going to be in some electronic clouds and not going to be in our library to look at what we have for the past years from here. I might be right about that. Anyway, uh, Cochran writes to Captain Ann, as we are almost within 100 miles of the city aisles, I'm setting this here. Just to let you know how we got along. We had to take a northern course and had close reaching all the first half of the way across. The westward is uh, just a fine boat. They're all hands on love with you. We had no heavy seas to buck into, but heavy gale and seas the last two days. She never shipped to sea. We had the square sole up some of the time, and it looked at times as though we would have to heave too. Charlie Barr says she was much steadier than the Atlantic, the boat that he made the record in five years earlier, under the same conditions, and very fast. I really have enjoyed every minute, and feel splendid about the boat, and am perfectly delighted with everything. Some of your reading is a little light for sea purposes, but we've had no real difficulty, so typical uh, light is never broke, so what else do you want? <laughs> <laughs> and there's the rest of another heavy wind day in the solar. And I think probably in this picture that would be the king's 
this up here a little bit. That would probably be uh, <coughs> the King's uh, Britannia. And they didn't brace together in 1910, but uh, in subsequent years, there were recorded 174 races between King George's Britannia and the West Wing. Principally when she was owned by her later owner, T.B. Davis. And the Westwood won more than the Britannia, but they both won races. This is another competitor. This is um, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, who you know was uh, related to Queen Victoria. But he was a very stolid, difficult man, apparently, and he was plotting World War I when this went on. And he had the Yard Media which is here, another big schooner. And um, the Westwood, first of all, went to Kiel, it's in, in northern Germany, and they had races with the Kaiser and a number of other very uh, brilliant German schooners. And from the standpoint of the Kaiser, the only thing went wrong was that Bar got every start, and he also got every finish. <laughs> <laughs> So after the season, the Kaiser communicated to Captain Nat, and he said that he didn't like losing all these races, and would Captain Nat design him a schooner to beat the Westwood? So Captain Nat gave it a little thought and made it a sketch, and had it sent over to the Kaiser with the uh, dimension, you know, the length, the beam, the draft, the weight, and so forth. And the Kaiser cable back, that wouldn't do because his harbor wasn't deep enough. <laughs> well, this was a case of two stubborn men of German extraction. Uh, <laughs> Captain Nat wasn't going to change the yacht because he realized unless he had that uh, much draft, she wouldn't sail well enough to beat the Western. So he cable back to the uh, German Kaiser and he said, I recommend you dredge out your harbor. <laughs> <laughs> so he never got that job. <laughs> <coughs> On board the Westwood, the uh, crew had not much. Uh, don't know whether that's in the race, they're just practicing, but anyway, you can see all the crew there on the rail. And the Harris saw Timmy here. Uh, Adam Langman and I designed a replica Harris saw Timmy that we got built, and it's uh, also now on board the Alianora. Uh, these guys climbing the rigging there give you a little sense of scale thing, don't they? Yes. Yeah, climbing up there or something. Yeah. <laughs> See how he's fitting the hoops on the mm -hmm. nice This is the most famous picture of the Western. It's taken by Beacon, the great photographers of uh, England. There are nine sails there. Uh, Mainsail, foresail, staysail, Luna, Spinnaker, and the rest is roaring in through the Solent, no doubt, to winning another race against the uh, large English vessels there in the summer of 1910. To my eye, that Spinnaker hole looks a little bit bent. No doubt it's been a lot of pressure in it, but again, it's light, it didn't break, so no problem. <laughs> well, here I am with uh, Ed Castellan, who was the brilliant fellow who built the Eleonora, who later built the Atlantic. And I'm here presenting to him a, picture, uh, a model that I bought at um, auction in New York City of the Atlantic, which he said he had to have because he actually built the Atlantic. And he's now uh, building the Ingomar, which I hope he'll finish. And uh, Ed's become a great friend and a great um, uh, friend to the museum. And he comes here every now and then and uh, loves the tradition. And we are a good picture of the yacht sailing. This is the uh, Eleanor. And uh, this is an early view on board. This is uh, Mr. Zach. Z, 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 Z. Yours truly. And Steve Carlson, who was the original uh, captain of the art for a long time under Mr. Zach. 
And here are some other pictures of my really uh, wonderful experiences sailing this boat. Because I never thought when I was younger that I'd ever get to sail a cable, which I've done. I never thought I'd get to sail a great schooner. And so it's been a thrill with me to be on these boats and sometimes steal them. And uh, it's just been great. Because again, that uh, same trio there in the uh, first picture. And uh, some other guests on board. And here we are also on board the boat. And here in a uh, rainy or windier day. We've had great racing in uh, uh, Cannes and Saint Tropez in South of France, in Antigua. And uh, uh, about a decade ago, Adam and I raced with them a lot in the uh, New York Cargo Cruise. And in that, we won every race but one. We had one race at the end that we didn't do too good a job with and we lost. Mr. Zack, who loved winning, he loved winning every one of those other races. <coughs> Terribly troubled that we didn't win that last race, which I admire. That's the way you should be if you really want to race a yacht. <laughs> He's got a very fancy end of the main room. Uh, he, it used to be uh, a habit on some of these schooners to put some kind of symbol on the steer. Now, I think this is a particularly desirable one, just a simple E for the name of the boat. And I'd like to show you a few details of how uh, elegant this boat was built. And uh, you can see here the steering wheel and uh, some of the fittings around there. Of course, one of the ways that you can sail with uh, a smaller crew is that a lot of the winches are electric winches. And uh, uh, Captain McCord will comment on that when we have his interview in a minute. And uh, there's a view of uh, the mast, a winch. And by the way, this is an interesting fitting, which is also replicated here on this is a sort of a forgiving attachment of the main sheet where um, there's a rubber at each end so that if you drive something it doesn't tear itself apart because the rubber gives it a little bit of relief. This is the main uh, gangway from the cockpit <laughs> down below. The elegant mahogany construction. Again, just like the original Westwood. <coughs> and here, oh. uh, simple interior. <laughs> 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 you can see the beautiful woodwork. You've got a lot of pictures of the boat, portholes above, and the flush deck. And even the passageways have this brilliant mahogany and uh, paneling, like originally. This is uh, just the drawers. And in every respect, including the hardware on the drawers and all, uh, they had tried to duplicate what was in the original boat. The arrangement's slightly different, but the decor, the um, <coughs> details, and the construction are every bit as fine as in the original Westwood. Okay. Notice, uh, in particular, as an example of that, this column that's at the corner of the uh, entrance into the main salon, and uh, the paneling of these red seats. This is uh, one of the guest cabins. Tough living. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the way uh, Eleonora appeared here in the summer. And I said to Mr. Zach one day when we were out selling, I said, you know, we just love having you around here. We wish we could have it here all the time. Well, he said, you only need about $8 million and you can have it here all the time. <laughs> Pretty sensible response. <laughs> And so we had some nice days on the boat. Um, I didn't sail on it as much this time as I did the last time here, but uh, all of us had the chance to get out, and it was uh, wonderful, uh, fun, and uh, uh, very satisfying to be able to sail on the boat. Here is uh, Larry. Wave is here. Larry, are you stealing? I think you are there, just like you. Mr. Zach, and uh, Roger, the captain. Some other pictures of how that wow. was uh, sailing her. And so we're going to go now to the interview, uh, which we had with uh, Brendan McCoy. It's about 10 minutes, and we'll give you a chance to uh, uh, get a sense of his great pleasure and his uh, satisfaction in being the skipper of this yacht. 
very indebted to uh, Svetlana here, who is the um, uh, author of and uh, producer of all the great documents of the museum now. They're much better brochures than ever. They all put together by Svetlana. And she, along with uh, Noreen, is tremendously helpful with me in putting together this program. Mr. T.B. Davis, who eventually bought the Eleonora, bought, bought the Western River in the 1920s and sailed here for almost 20 years. He was a big, tough, rough guy who made his money in uh, Africa. And he uh, had come from Jersey in the Channel Islands, and he kept the yacht there. And he was famous for liking to sail in very heavy weather and to win races. But one regatta in the in the solar where it was always windy and rough. But it was so rough they didn't want to race. So T B Davis said the heck with that, he said, we're going out and sailing anyway, and he went out just sail around in the gale and uh, And uh, he as I mentioned before, 174 races with the uh, with King George's Britannia. And apparently, they became very good friends. And probably Davis was one of the few that would say what he thought to the king, because probably most people don't do that. And I admire him for what he did with the Westwood. as a, a picture of her rounding one of the marks that's in the uh, eastern uh, Sultan near uh, the Isle of Wight. But among other things, uh, I admire him. He had a very great ability with four letter words. He was one of the best stirrers <laughs> around anybody ever had. And there's a story how he was visiting some town in another port in England, and it was a Sunday, and there was a church service, and TB and his wife went to the service, and then afterwards, he went back to the yacht, and something had gone wrong, he was down below, and the um, minister of this little church brought all the ladies and the children down there, and they had TB <laughs> letting go of all the four letter words down in the engine room, uh, not knowing they were all up there on deck. So the minister sent word he didn't want the, uh, oh, they didn't want the uh, Westwood to never come back. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a great character, but he did great with the yacht. By the way, you don't have to haul the boats out in the Jersey. So just go in and make sure she's tilted a little bit towards the pier and then try to put it down and you can go down and clean up or hit the bottom, no worries. The tide is at least 30 feet up and down. And there's another great picture of the, uh, of the great place we're coming along. Now, you know what happened to that yacht was that King George, when he died, didn't want anybody selling the Britannia to sully his yacht that he thought so much of. So he left in his will orders that the Britannia was to be taken out into the English Channel and sunk. <laughs> so TB, who lived quite a few years more until uh, into World War II time, uh, had somewhat the same view. No doubt he got the idea from A. George. And in his will, he decreed that he hoped that there might be a new buyer that would be somebody like himself who would really appreciate the yacht and uh, take proper care of it and use it in racing and cruising that he had. But if that wasn't the case, they were to 
follow the example of King George and scuttle the yacht. So they took from her the uh, binnacle and the wheel and some of the winches and some of the uh, silverware down below and details. And those have been placed in a wonderful little museum in Jersey. It's a museum that you all, when you're in London, you might like to go to Jersey and you might like to see it. They also have a bar there where they took half of the Rapstrake Harrisoff uh, tender and cut it, they cut it in half. And the bar is made up of the port side of the tender, and the bartender in the middle of the boat, and the patrons on the, the rail uh, sitting there to have their drinks. <laughs> and I took Mr. Zack and Suzanne there, and they had a fascinating time seeing all these old items. And uh, Mr. Zack duplicated some of the prizes there, and he made a trophy for what he called the Western Cup, which he started in uh, England. And that's been a very successful thing, and he's done in the trophy for that. So uh, as a consequence of that, they then took the uh, westward out to what's called the Hood Deep off the shore of Yarrow White, and set off some dynamite, and she sunk there, and the rebel was in a sea-going mm -hmm. grave, not too far from the Britannia. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great pleasure to uh, bring this story to you, and I hope that you will share with me the inspiration of the Western and Eleonora as one of the best ways in which it is a continuation of the great history in which this museum is organized, in which it's so <coughs> successfully carrying out under the auspices of Bill Lynn and Vector. So thank you very much. We don't know what will happen because the yacht is up for sale. Many of you have uh, seven or eight million dollars. Uh, I'm sure she stays here. But uh, I think that given the connection here, that whoever owns that yacht is to be persuaded to come back here again. And we hope that they will be able to do that. Yes, yeah, right back there. Uh, uh, one of your slides that showed uh, the building of uh, Schooners in 1919 was uh, built for C. Tucker. Was that for Claude Tucker, my great uncle? Well, I think I need to examine that photo a little more carefully with you. Uh, could well be. Uh, let's, uh, sometime we'll get together and we'll study that and see if we can uh, decide what it, it really yeah, is. Yeah, he had coral, and I don't remember the Oklahoma. Coral was the last commercial schooner for the uh, islands. Well, uh, let's, let's figure it out. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. Well, <coughs> in, in that photograph, and on some of the sail plans, it shows a, a sheet from the end of the jackyard topsail uh, clue. It goes down to the boom. Is there a purchase on the boom to trim that, or does it go to a winch? Well, yeah, it goes to a block in the boom and is led uh, along the boom to a position near the mast where you can adjust the trim of it. That's one of the ways to make that sail work. That's the hardest sail to set up and make draw properly as you can all imagine, but uh, done right, it's a wonderful uh, addition. 
complicated boat to sail, very complicated rigging, but when it's all right and you're going along in a strong breeze, steering that boat, that's a nice effort. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I spoke to Brendan earlier this evening, and the boat got to Antigua in one piece, so everybody's safe and sound. Um, I also just want to mention that uh, a lot of the images in the pres pres presentation from Ellie and Nora this year were provided by Bob Baglini, uh, so thanks, Bob. In yeah. uh, uh, January, I think it's the 18th, our friend Warren Barker, who is here, Warren, uh, there he is, um, is going to be coming and uh, doing a lecture um, the third Thursday in January about what these guys are up to at IRIS, so hopefully you'll all join us then. And you can be, check the website for more information on that. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody, and I uh, hope to see you soon.